Severed heads might be a common motif in horror films, but what exactly do they have to do with folklore? Surprisingly, quite a lot. An obvious example would be Perseus cutting off Medusa's head in Greek mythology. Then we have the severed head of Welsh hero Bran, allegedly buried beneath the Tower of London. And of course, you can't talk about severed heads without talking about headless horsemen. So let's dig into the folklore of severed heads in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there, and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. I do hope that you're well. I unfortunately am not. I'm still struggling with my sciatica and various issues related to depression and anxiety. So, you know, it's not exactly been a particularly good time lately. But I'm here and we're still going to do this episode because, quite frankly, that's just what I do. So this week we're going to have a look at the severed head. And partly this was because one of my fabulous listeners and one of my very best friends, Kaz, said how much she'd enjoyed the Gallows episode last week. And she said, was there anything about beheadings in Sohan that might work? And then I thought, you know what, this would actually be a really good opportunity to look at things like the Headless Horseman, because obviously the Headless Horseman via Sleepy Hollow has become quite synonymous with Halloween in some ways. So I thought we'll just kind of add them all in there together. So obviously content warning, we will be discussing severed heads, but hopefully that won't be a problem. Now, like I said in the introduction, severed heads are quite common motifs in horror films in particular. You also get them in comedies as well sometimes depends what the film's about and there are some genuinely dreadful films that I had to watch because I wrote a chapter about heads and faces in gothic horror in a book about body parts in gothic horror and I had to watch The Incredible Two-Headed Transplant and The Thing with Two Heads both of which are fairly dreadful films but they're basically about this idea of trying to transplant heads which obviously so far hasn't actually worked out in science. The heads are probably more famous from the idea of being mounted on pikes so that people to know that this person's been executed. Obviously, they are a good way to let your enemies know that you mean business. And also, it's partly because of the fact that the head and therefore the face are a lot more recognisable than other random body parts. And of course, obviously, you could live without other body parts, but the severed head is the really final one. So we're going to start off with the French Revolution because you can't talk about decapitation and not mention it. And you might then wonder what that's got to do with folklore. But as with any event whose impact is far-reaching and based on fear, several urban legends did spring up around the guillotine and her bloodlust. And one tale appears several times, which is that of a ghostly woman who holds her decapitated head in place with a choker. And she haunts the space near where the guillotine was. A young man sees her, is captivated by her beauty, takes her home and then in the morning discovers that she's actually headless because he removes the choker and her head generally then falls away which would be a little bit of a shock at the morning after. Now Washington Irving, yep he of the Headless Horseman fame, actually wrote a story about it called The Adventures of a German Student and he wrote it in 1824 so the French Revolution would have still been in living memory for some people. Now we're going to move on to Norse mythology and Norse legends can occasionally become difficult to follow because texts might refer to a range of characters often with the same name and you do also have issues around when a legend was actually written down. But Mimir is the character that we're going to be having a look at here and there are some doubts as to whether Mimir is a single character or indeed two and one of the versions of Mimir guarded the well of wisdom at the foot of Yggdrasil the world tree. Now the version we're concerned with is the one who got caught up in the war between the Aesir and the Vanir, two clans of gods. And the Aesir sent Mimir to the Vanir as a hostage. For various reasons that we don't have time to go into, the Vanir decapitated him and then returned his head to the Aesir. Now, mourning the loss of a great advisor, Odin ended up with Mimir's severed head, and he was actually able to preserve it using herbs, which also returned Mimir's power of speech. So Mimir could still help people, he could still make prophecies, and so on. And Odin kept Mimir's head by the well of wisdom so that he could ask Mimir for counsel whenever he needed him. Now, along with the sacrifice of his eye that Odin did have to make by hanging on Idrasil, Mimir did repay Odin for doing all of this for him with the runes. Now, there is some debate about whether Mimir ever actually regains his body or not, because some of the later stories do seem to imply that he does, 
but for our purposes here, his role as a bodiless advisor is what's important. And it does sort of speak to that power of mythology that a character can be beheaded, but then can still continue to play a role as a character. And indeed, our next mythological character does the same thing. And this is the head of Orpheus. Now, Orpheus is probably most famous within Greek mythology for his descent into the underworld, where, long story short, he's having his wedding day with Eurydice, She's bitten by a snake and dies and is then taken to the underworld and Orpheus decides he's going to go to the underworld and ask for her back. He goes down there, makes his case. In some versions of the story, Persephone, queen of the underworld, is the one who sort of takes pity on him and is like, yeah, you've argued that quite well. And she persuades Hades to let Eurydice go, but there's one catch. Orpheus has to walk out of the underworld and not look back and just trust that Eurydice is behind him. And if he looks back at any point, she'll be lost forever and she'll have to stay in the underworld. So Orpheus then leaves the underworld and he's almost at the end and, true to form, turns around just to double check that she's there and then sees her having to return back into the underworld again. Now, the stories differ about what he did when he actually left the underworld, but for whatever reason, he was dismembered and someone nailed his severed head to his lyre. After it fell into the ocean, it washed up on the island of Lesbos. And Orpheus continued to sing, and the lesbians actually created a shrine for it in a cave. Now, as the son of a muse himself, Orpheus needed no muse, and he eventually became more popular than the oracles of Lesbos. But in his most famous legend, and this is one of my favourite ones, Apollo gets really tired of Orpheus's incessant chatter and tells him to shut up. But again, it just shows how a character can be dismembered or decapitated and continue to play a, a role in various myths and so on. Now we're going to change gears slightly from mythology to saints because I've been long fascinated by religious relics and the power that becomes associated with them and St Catherine's severed head is just one of them. Now St Catherine of Siena does have quite a memorable story. She lived during the 14th century and legends attribute her with stigmata and even levitation. Now she actually died in Rome at the age of 33 and the people of Siena wanted her body back for burial and the Roman officials refused. So a few townspeople from Siena travelled to Rome to steal her remains. Now they did realise how difficult it would be to smuggle a whole body out of the tomb so they decided to decapitate her instead. Indeed some of the legends actually say her body was so badly decomposed by the conditions in the tomb that she was almost headless anyway. Now either way the Siena locals succeeded in their task. They left the tomb to smuggle the head out of Rome in a bag and God stopped them demanding to see what was inside the bag so they prayed to St Catherine for help. When the guard paid inside, they saw only a pile of rose petals. So they did actually manage to get her head back to Siena. And you can see the head safely ensconced behind glass in her home church there. And I do like that story. But obviously I did mention in the introduction the headless horseman. So we can't really talk about severed heads without talking about him. If you talk about severed heads, he's the the other end of the spectrum where you've got the head at one end and he's the headless body at the other end of the spectrum. Now, obviously, the most famous headless horseman of all is probably the one immortalised by Washington Irving in The Legend of Sleepy Hollow. Now, his original story, spoiler alert, by Washington Irving does imply that human agency is actually behind the appearance of the aforementioned horseman, not anything supernatural, which obviously isn't the direction that Tim Burton took in the 1999 adaptation. And indeed, it's also not the direction that the Sleepy Hollow TV series took either. But a lot of these stories do look at the traditional folklore of the area and in these the horsemen apparently died during the American Revolutionary War and decapitated during a battle in 1776. His ghost then roams the area every Halloween in search of his missing head. Now some of the articles I read did seem to cite Dutch folktales as the source of the headless horseman which is possibly due in part to the existence of a Dutch story about a headless horseman roaming around Tarrytown, New York State one Halloween. But the stories of headless horsemen, or indeed headless figures, are a lot older. So we are going to have to go to Ireland for one of these. Now the headless horseman is known as the Dullahan in Irish folklore. And he roams the back roads of rural Ireland, collecting the souls of the dead. In most stories, he dresses in black and he rides a black horse. Although in some stories, he does actually drive a coach pulled by six horses. Coffins, gravestones and bones make up the coach. And the horses gallop so fast that their hooves set fire to the hedges lining the road. Now, whichever version it is, the Dullahan often carries a whip made of a human spine in one hand. And in the other, he carries his own head, which glows acting as a lantern. Now, he has been known to lash out the eyeballs of anyone who sees him. And deaths occur whenever he stops riding and calls out a name. 
if you heard him call yours, then you would be the next to die. However, he fears gold, which sends him fleeing into the dark, which is quite interesting because usually for figures like this, you would imagine that would be iron, but no, in his case, it's gold. And obviously there is the episode about the folklore of gold in the folklore of metals a few weeks ago. Now, Bridget Haggerty relates a tale in which a Galway man heard the Dullahan come up behind him on a country road. Now, he knew he wasn't going to be able to outrun the Dullahan, but he did know how to outwit the Dullahan. And luckily, he had a gold coin with him. He dropped it in the road behind him and the Dullahan disappeared with a mighty roar. Now, some people believe that the Dullahan's origins lie in the 6th centuries, when Christian missionaries banned the worship of Crom Duv, the Celtic god of fertility. Every year he demanded a human sacrifice, which was usually created using decapitation. Now, once the Christians banned his worship, it does appear that the locals may have turned him into a terrifying figure that still demanded corpses, and eventually Crom Duv fell out of the stories and the horseman became the Dullahan. Now, obviously, there are some tales of headless figures elsewhere. So, in Scotland, a man named Ewan apparently became a headless horseman after being decapitated in a clan battle. He lost his chance to be chieftain, as well as his head, and accounts state that both he and his horse are headless. Now, tales of acephalous coasts are rare in England, and that just basically means headless, something that Owen Davies puts down to the fact that our method of execution has been hanging, so therefore there's no real reason why... English ghosts would be headless. Although, obviously, there are all the stories of Anne Boleyn apparently wandering around various royal palaces carrying her head under her arm. But Davies does note the existence of a single English headless horseman who haunts a track in Wiltshire every New Year's Eve. And according to a local legend, he'd made a wager to make it home in Stourton from Wincanton Market in seven minutes. Now, he broke his neck during the race, which apparently explains the headless state of his phantom. German folklore is slightly different and locals blamed windstorms on the appearances of these spectral headless hunters and they were accompanied by mysterious noises. The Grimm brothers collected two folk tales, both set in Saxony, and in one a woman goes out to gather acorns early one morning. After hearing a hunting horn, she sees a headless man astride a grey horse. Now he speaks to her and identifies himself as Hans Jagentufel, telling her a tale of his former life of wickedness. In another, the wild huntsman was a man named Hackelberg in life. On his deathbed, he begged God to allow him to continue riding in the hunt until Judgment Day, and God actually granted his strange request. Yet the sounds from Hackelberg's wild huntsman actually provide a warning to others. So if any heard the sounds during the night and still went hunting the following day, they would meet some kind of misfortune in the woods. Those who heard the sounds avoided the hunt and so avoided any nasty accidents. And of course, elsewhere in German folklore, the headless horseman hunts those who commit capital crimes. And the opening lines of the Hans Jagenteufel story actually note that any who escaped beheading for their crimes in life were doomed to wander headless throughout eternity. So maybe the German horsemen are trying to even up the score. So what do we ultimately make of these stories? Well, I do think it's quite interesting that when you look at the mythological ones, so if you're looking at, say, the Norse one or Orpheus or indeed Medusa, the characters all manage to still play a role in the stories, even once they've been decapitated. So such is their power, their head sort of stands in for them as a person or a character, and then they continue to play a role in some way. And this is, I would argue, something that we then also see in the Welsh story of Bran. And I do obviously have a separate episode on that, which is why I haven't gone into him in too much detail. But I think it is more interesting when you then look at the Headless Horseman characters because obviously they're still related to the severed head in the fact that they don't have a head. But they have some kind of link with death. So they either become an omen of death or they become a warning of some description. And I think that that's quite an interesting twist on the idea that they've, because they've still got their body, they've got a little bit more agency in how they move through the world and so on. And obviously, I think part of the reason why they are so scary is the fact that you're not really expecting a headless body to be able to function. So they do provide that element of fear, which I think some of these stories do obviously rely on. Now, obviously, there are lots of historical stories of people who have been executed and then their heads have been put on pikes and so on. And I think that it is that recognisability factor, which is why even that area has then become so mythical and there's a brilliant episode by the lawmen recently which was actually about the severed head of Oliver Cromwell and how it essentially goes missing and it just goes to show how severed heads of historical figures can then almost accrue folklore of their own as well so I really recommend that you go and listen to that one as well because it is really good 
And it is, of course, testament to one of the things that we do see where severed heads of real people do then take on this almost kind of mythical state is due to what happens to them almost after death. So even like Joseph Haydn was decapitated after he'd been buried. And part of what you find during the awful trend for phrenology, which I've discussed before and its horrifically racist origins, but because people wanted to get hold of skulls to read people's heads and so on to try and find out which parts of their skull correspond to their character. You did find that obviously people were then ended up getting decapitated so there was a supply of skulls from somewhere. And I think that all the weird real history of things like that then ends up then adding into the folklore associated with these severed heads of real historical figures. Whereas obviously the mythological figures don't really have this problem. So it is it is fascinating subject and if you are interested in things like this, because I know there will be some people out there like me who are, there's a fantastic book by Francis Larson called Severed which is really really interesting and I'll actually link that below so I highly recommend that one. But that is that for this week and next week we're going to do something slightly different because I ran a poll on Twitter because you know how I like being democratic and I was asking people what would they prefer to see for like the proper Halloween episode because obviously this will go out on the 29th which is obviously next Saturday. And it was a com- it was a choice between did you want to have like a traditional ghost story or did you want to hear some of my paranormal experiences? And ninety percent of you wanted to hear my paranormal experiences, so I will be telling sort of some real life ghost stories, I guess. Obviously, in some cases, I will be skeptical where necessary, but I will tell you some of the weird things that have happened to me over the years. You can make of them what you will, and hopefully, you'll enjoy them. I didn't necessarily enjoy the things at the time, but looking back on them, it was quite interesting. So that is what we're doing next week. So I hope you enjoy that. Um, Thanks as ever to my fabulous patrons for helping to keep the podcast going. As always, if financial obligations preclude you from supporting the podcast in that fashion, just tell a friend. Honestly, spreading the word about it is free and it's also really, really helpful. So please feel free to leave reviews or just tweet about it or whatever it is. Or just tell somebody that you know at work who you think might like it. And that's all really class as well. And obviously, thank you so much to anyone who does that already. It really does help. But that is it for this week's episode. I hope that you have a marvellous week ahead. And I'll see you next week when we have a look at some of my real life ghost stories. Cheerio. Well, thanks for listening. And I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, feel free to leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts because that helps other people find the show too. It also takes between four and six hours to research, write, record and edit these episodes. So if you want to help support my time in doing that, then you can buy me a coffee or you can join the Fabulous Folklore family on Patreon and enjoy extra benefits, including exclusive episodes and articles and even illustrated talks. All the links you need are below and thanks in advance.